Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord, another oldie. I hope you enjoyed that as a prelude for this segment or second interlude hymn. Um, again, welcome. If this is your first time joining us, uh, again, we're glad that you found us. And um, while we're unable to meet in our regular public gathering spaces there in Clarksburg and Hyattstown, we have found this to be a way to uh, gather and worship in virtual space. Welcome. I'm glad that you were able to find us and join us today. Last Sunday was Peace with Justice Sunday. You may still participate. Um, the final pages of the bulletin that can be downloaded from the Clarksburg United Methodist Church website, the final pages of that have some extra information about it. And so if you'd like to download that, and it's a PDF, easily viewable. So um, next Sunday is Father's Day, and if you'd like to send me a picture of your dad, I'll put together a collage that we can share next week. Um, just a thought. And um, any other announcements that we have, we will um, share together in our time on Zoom at 11 o'clock. As we begin the second segment of our worship today, focusing on the scriptures and our response to them in life, Let's offer this prayer together. God of wonder, you appeared to Abraham as three persons, and you reveal your fullness in your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit fills your people with hope through the peacemaking cross of Christ. Gather us as Christ's faithful disciples and empower us with his good news. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. During the weeks after Pentecost, there are two possible lectionary tracks. Each of them uses the same gospel and epistle lesson, as you see here on this screen. But one of the tracks, the one called Semi-Continuous, the first lesson is chosen to give a more consistent pattern of reading through the Hebrew Scriptures with a psalm that relates to that reading while the other, a complementary track, jumps around more, picking up readings that are in some way related to the New Testament readings for the day. We have tended to follow the semi-continuous track, but others who use the lectionary may be selecting the alternate track. If you notice any differences in your conversations with your friends from other churches regarding the scriptures they've heard on a given Sunday, this can be part of the reason. Of course, we all have the option of uh, selecting scriptures other than the lectionary if we think that is a good idea on any given occasion as well. So there, there can be many reasons for hearing different scriptures on different Sundays. So our scriptures for today, I have read for you in full the uh, semi-continuous track that I have listed above, the exception being the psalm which we used as our opening in the first segment of our liturgy today. Um, but the other lessons, Genesis, Romans, and Matthew, I've read in full in a separate video. And you can click on that and uh, listen to it there. Here I'd like to just highlight a few of the verses from those readings. From Genesis. The narrative relates how Abraham was visited by God at an oak grove, not far from what is present-day Hebron, and he and Sarah spared no effort in preparing a major meal. Baking bread and roasting a calf, that's not something that you do quickly. And before Abraham's visitors left, one of them reaffirmed the promise previously given. The visitor said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. So Sarah laughed at this preposterous idea. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you, in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? 
from Romans chapter 5, which we read as our words of assurance in the first section. Paul speaks of the peace with God that's ours through Christ, so Paul suggests we should be glad even in times of trouble. Such times are used by God to, to shape our character so that we are more like Christ. And he concludes, God puts his love for us beyond all doubt by the fact Christ died on our behalf while we were still sinners. God's love for us is beyond doubt. Two key ideas so far today. Then the third section I want to highlight is from Matthew 9. In Matthew's narrative of the life and ministry of Jesus, he takes note of the compassion of Christ. Seeing the crowds who had gathered, he saw them as distressed and harassed, um, comparing them to sheep. As I read that, I hear it as if dogs were chasing them about and um, making their lives miserable. Okay. Sport. In compassion, Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. Therefore petition, begging the owner of the harvest to send laborers to gather in his harvest. And calling his twelve to him, Jesus gave them authority over foul spirits, so that they could drive them out, as well as power of curing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And he instructed them, Wherever you go, proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, make lepers clean, drive out demons. You've received God's generosity, and so you're to be generous in turn. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God of redemption, summon us to Sarah's joy, to Abraham's wonder, and to Paul's confident hope through the word and work of the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Today I'm offering the title, Dream On, Dream Big, Dream Audacious. What does it mean to be a Christian? I think the answer you get will depend on who you ask. These days at least, and maybe in many other times as well, those who are not Christians already may have a pretty dim view on the subject. And then if you ask the insiders, those who should know, well, maybe the best they can do is to say, well, this is what it means to them. A very subjective definition. And since they are so subjective, there may be as many answers as there are those who call themselves Christians. One Christian might say that being a Christian is about what one does and what one does not. A set of behavioral expectations. Another might say that it's about following the golden rule, which actually has analogs in various faith traditions. This is hardly a unique touchstone for being a Christian. And even if it were, I would suggest it's more honored in the breach than in, than in its observance. Yet another Christian might say that it's about following the teachings of a certain rabbi who lived uh, some 2,000 years ago. Now again, whether we consider the um, popular wisdom expressed through um, humorous media such as Homer Simpson, or more serious declamations such as those offered by the current occupant of the White House, or most any person on the street, there's some difference of opinion on how practical and practicable following those teachings really is. G.K. Chesterton once observed in What's Wrong with the World, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. If following the teachings of a certain rabbi is what it means to be a Christian, how is that good news? 
Now, someone else might say that it means that the spirit of Jesus lives on and the crucifixion didn't end his movement. And the resurrection's a poetic way of talking about that, as would be also then the coming of the spirit at Pentecost. But if the authorities succeeded in ending the life of Jesus, and it's only his spirit that lives on and fits and starts in the movement that we call the church, how is that good news? Frederick Beekner offers this. Turn around and believe that the good news that we are loved is better than we ever dared hope. And that to believe that good news, to live out of it and toward it, to be in love with that good news, is of all glad things in this world, the gladdest thing of all. That appears in his book, The Clown in the Belfry, Writings on Faith and Fiction. So, with that as background, try this on. See how it fits for you. I would offer that we gain some insights into why the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, really is good news from each of our readings today. Now, probably there are many more, but here are a few that I am seeing right now. In the letter to the Christians at Rome, Paul offers two insights on this. First, God's love is extravagant and offered to people who plainly do not deserve it. Now, both aspects of this are good news because if we wanted to deserve to earn God's love, well, we each know our failings and God discerns them even more clearly than we. But that doesn't preclude God loving us and loving not just a little bit, but by putting God's all on the line for us. God took upon God's self all that it means to be human. From, from infancy to a tortured death. And Paul suggests this proves God's love. And if that doesn't break our hearts, turning us to repentance, I don't know what could. In this letter, Paul also said God intends to work to bring good out of circumstances of our lives that would break us. Using the troubles that afflict us to mold us, to shape us, to build in us the character of Christ. God's love not only seeks us, but works in us a transformation of which we, unaided, would be incapable. Who dares to think that they could live a life like Christ? Yet that is exactly what God is making of us, transforming us even through the events that seem to conspire to try to break us. Turning to the first lesson, it asks, is anything too wonderful for God? In this narrative, we see a conviction that God is concerned for our fulfillment. And one of the great disappointments in life for Abraham and Sarah was that they had never had children. And now the time was well past. Becoming parents is an adventure for young people. Can God really make this kind of difference? Now, I do not think that this text means that every person over 40 who prays, never mind those over 80, seeking to have children in their middle or senior years, will find those prayers answered in the affirmative. But what is clear is that God had selected Abraham and Sarah for a special purpose in this world, and God would make that happen. God would keep God's promises. God cares about God's children, all the children of Adam and Eve. God is concerned for and involved with our lives for our fulfillment as it works to fulfill God's purposes. The gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, is being presented in the narrative from Matthew. 
Jesus is embodying that good news by healing and by preaching throughout his larger neighborhood, the region of Galilee. The compassion of God is revealed here. The people had no leader, no shepherd. They were anxious, troubled, distressed, and harassed. Pray to every wild dog that would bully them. Make no mistake, there is a deep dimension of political commentary here. So, a fourth part of the good news from our text today is that the gospel is that God cares about the political order. And in Christ, and in the followers of Christ, God is at work presently to improve things in the political order. And the fifth point, the good news is about being commissioned ourselves by Christ to take up the work of healing and of casting out evil spirits. As clergy, some of the bishop's words to us, commissioning us for our task, is, Take thou authority. Those are Christ's words to all his followers. Take thou authority, cure the sick, raise the dead, make the lepers clean, drive out demons. You've received the generosity of God. Now give freely, generously, making a real difference in your world. There's a story that goes something like this. Karl Barth, German theologian, was at Rockefeller Chapel on the campus of the University of Chicago during his lecture tour of the United States in 1962. And after his lecture, during, during the question and answer time, a student asked Barth if he would summarize his whole life's work, his theology, in a sentence. Barth allegedly said something like, Yes, I can. In the words of a song I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now, I would say that's a very good start as a Sunday school lesson for those new to the faith. But I would say it is only a start. Now, I'm not saying that I think I'm better than Bart, just as I don't believe Bart was saying that nothing mattered in his teaching beyond that one sentence. So here it is then. Yes, Jesus loves me, and by extension loves everyone, all the children in this world. God has compassion when our lives are less than we hoped they would be, and has something even more wonderful for us than we can imagine, if we will receive it. God has compassion when our world seems to be falling apart and people are at each other's throats. God has established Christ as the shepherd king, enthroned at God's right hand. And we are Christ's own chosen agents of that kingdom. The gospel of God is for the healing of our world. But first, a lot of things will need to be deconstructed. And that will be uncomfortable. Are we willing to dream the big dreams for our world, for our nation, for our community, for our church, for our family, for ourselves? big dreams, the truly big dreams, the audacious dreams, dreams that will mean changes, dreams that will mean people will look on afterward in amazement and say, that's something only God could have done. Dream on.
Today we have this second hymn from Carolyn Winfrey Gillette. O God, our Creator, you work every day. It is set to a very familiar tune, so you should find it easy to sing. I hope that you find the words meaningful as well. For our closing prayer today, God of all power and peace, as Jesus sent his disciples out to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to gather the lost, to raise the dead, and to proclaim the nearness of your realm, make us ready to go and share the good news we have received through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reminder that Instead of the YouTube live stream at 11 o'clock, we're doing a Zoom gathering. It's a more interactive experience. If you don't yet have the information, contact Gary. Um, this is a time to chat. What's on your mind? Again, I wish to thank you for your faithfulness in continuing to support financially the work of our parish. God sends God's Spirit among us so that we can be gifted to serve in a multitude of ways. And we're given the gift of faith that enables us to live in hope and to love radically and to share generously. So daily we worship God in all the ways of our life with everything we have to offer. We give, not so that God will bless us. We've already received God's generosity. And so we we wish to be generous in turn, as Jesus said. Jesus summons us to answer God's call of mercy. Christ gathers us and gives us power to be healed and to heal, to be forgiven and to forgive, to be freed from sin and to set others free, to tell one another and the world God's presence is always at hand. So let's worship God with our daily lives. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. May the love of God and the grace of Christ and the Spirit's peace be with you always. Another oldie for our postlude today, Rescue the Perishing. See you at 11 on Zoom. Mm -hmm.